disrupted, but we try and do an annual event where we do a joint event. Um, and basically this event is talking about a topic of resources and recycling and the opportunities that are there within that industry for employment. So when we're people talking about green jobs, this is what we're talking about. So best person to speak about it is our external affairs director because he's kind of the expert. So if I can pass you over to Adam, I'm sure he can explain far better than I can. Thank you very much. Ian said, oh, you'd love to come to Hereford and give a lecture, wouldn't you? Oh, yes, Ian, I'd love to come to Hereford and give a lecture. I didn't realise what the traffic was like coming across <laughs> the Midlands. But anyway, uh, Dr. Adam Reid, External Affairs Director at Suez, and I'm going to talk about waste and resources. Let's see if I can make this work. There we go. Lots of slides, but I'm going to dip in and out. I'm going to see how you respond. This is your evening. You've made the effort to come. Um, I want to this is just to prove that I'm another chartered institution, so I get to wear a chain now and again. I do dress up, so I'm the president of the Chartered Institution of Waste Management. But actually, that's not why I'm here. I'm here because I spend all my time on social media blogging about waste management. I talk about resources, I talk about consumption, I talk about policy reform. I'm busy giving government hard times this morning. I was lecturing at Cardiff University about new novel technologies. At lunchtime, I was giving Treasury a hard time because they haven't got a clue when it comes to setting policy that's going to curb consumption. I'll come back to consumption later, so don't worry about me. I, I kind of know what I'm talking about. Now, I got asked to talk about all of these things, because Ian thought, oh, it's only an hour. How many things can we cram in to an hour? Honestly. So I went, no, 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 let's talk about these things. Make it a bit more like, science. Look, I'll put it into boxes for you, Ian, OK? So I'm going to do a little bit about how the sector's evolving. Some of you will think about me as landfill or hump it and lump it or Mr. Collection. I'm a little bit more advanced than that now. Um, about the policy landscape, waste has been in the media more in the last two years than probably ever, unless you've got a local tip near you, in which case it's always in the media. I appreciate that. Um, I then want to talk about skills because this is my particular passion. I'm going to come back to why is it my passion and why do I think the future is all about green skills. And then a bit of future proofing, and if you're still here, we do some Q&A. If you've left, clearly I didn't do my job properly. So, Suez, what's our role? Well, here we go. We do a bit of bin lifting. Yes, we will come and get your bins from some of your doors. We'll take it to a facility. We might sort it, try and pull out some valuable recyclables, your plastic, your carbon, your aluminium, your steel. This is paper waiting to be bailed. This is a picking belt where we're going to get some very qualified dudes to pull stuff out because you couldn't sort it at the curbside properly. Well, maybe not you because you're here tonight, but all the other hundreds of thousands of people that aren't here tonight who don't sort properly. So we sort for you. And if we can't, we'll produce a fuel. This is a flock. This is a dried residual black bin waste stream. And why do we, why do we produce that? Because Semex wants a low carbon fuel to meet their obligations under climate change. And we can produce that from your black bin, your black bag. By doing a bit of sorting, doing a bit of drying, and using a bit of physics and chemistry on the way. And if not, we'll burn it, and we'll generate electricity and heat and power. We don't like landfilling stuff. And over the last 20 years, Suez has gone from landfilling 80% of all the waste we handle, and we are the second biggest waste management operator in the UK. We now landfill 5% of everything we handle. That's better than the market average, but more importantly, everybody's driving landfill down, so it's all good news. Now, we do that by working in partnership. We do that by being innovative. We do that by investing in strange stuff. So here's the innovation that Ian likes so much. We might look at odd materials that need to be recovered, MDF, it's low grade, it's full of, uh, well, it's full of glue. Yeah, uh, where's the value in recycling that? Well, there is some. Or how about feeding leftover food to black fly larvae, growing them and turning them into a feedstock for livestock? One waste stream, another feedstock. That's quite interesting. It's not your waste, it's not the food waste from your home, but from industry. Partnering with big plastics manufacturers, because if they demand a certain feedstock quality to produce recycled content plastic bottles, then I know what we've got to do at our facilities to feed that. And we can adapt 
the technology, the equipment, the staff to pull that material out. So it's about value chain, it's about understanding, it's about investment, it's about innovation. And a lot of it's about going circular. Now, Ian was telling me that he remembers way back when, post-war, everything was recycling, repair, everything had value, and then we went all global consumer, we went plastic, we went cheap, we went convenience, we went on the go. One of these things created a waste problem. Today, we're trying to dismantle all of that and bring things back into reuse, into repair, dismantling. Recycling, the one you all love, it sits there. It is not the top of any hierarchy. It is not the ultimate aim. It's not the goal of waste management. That makes things go round a few more times. Plastic, six, seven. Paper, three or four. Glass, 10, 12. Aluminium, infinite. But the bottom line is, that can't be the answer. We can't just keep consuming. But you do that by changing what we do here. So historically, waste management has been about coming to your door and collecting. And the lorry trundles off and it tips it in hole in the ground. And then we went, that's not good enough. So we trundled along the road, we picked up all of your rubbish, and we took it to someone like an energy from waste plant, and we generated some electricity, and that was a bonus. Then two vehicles came down your street. One collected the rubbish, and the other one was collecting some recyclables. You had to do something to make that work. Then I could do something more to make that work. Well, now I'm way beyond collection. I'm into harvesting. And why do I talk about harvesting? Because harvesting is collection with purpose. I want that material stream, so I harvest it. I might harvest it from your doorstep. I might harvest it from a supermarket. I might harvest it from a bin on the high street, but I want that material so I go and get it. Not collection. And that's the future. So plastics 101. Everybody loves a bit of plastic, don't they? <laughs> so we're going to get plastic. Plastics in a recycling bin, mixed recycling. Or we've got these lovely curbside sort vehicles. And my bin men, sorry, my recycling operatives. <laughs> there we go. They'll put organics in here, they'll put plastics in there, they'll put cardboard in there, they'll put glass in the one after, they're sorting it from your bin at the curbside, better quality. More chance for that material to get into a recycled marketplace. But plastics are light. Plastics contribute nothing to the recycling targets that every local authority has been asked to achieve. Plastics cost me fuel to move for very little value. So we need to think carefully about how we get plastics. Now, these are these facilities. There's my curbside sort vehicle, different compartments. Tip it on the belt, and you've got plastics and you've got metals on this belt. We're only taking plastics and metals into this facility, and then we let the machinery do its thing. It's going to do some wonderful sorting. And it sorts by weight, by shape, by colour, and by material type. Clever stuff. We'll have some hand sorting, we'll have some quality control, and ultimately you're looking to make this stream HDPE only, milk bottles, PET only, water bottles, pots, tubs and trays, used to be black, not anymore, kind of grey, because black wasn't sortable on the belt, because the near infrared optic lasers confused it with the belt. So we're evolving all the time as the material streams we handle change, and that's one of my big bugbears. I'm the back end of the solution, aren't I? I'm the back end of the problem. I'm trying to work out how to deal with your stuff because you put it out. Sometimes in the right bin, sometimes not. It amazes me, we've got a green bin. What do you put in a green bin? It depends on your Herefordshire or Shropshire. There's Brilliant. <laughs> if, if you live in Northamptonshire, it means something entirely different. But, but I've got a green bin, well, I live in Warwickshire now. I've got a green bin and in it goes green waste. So green waste is, Garden waste. Garden waste. Team point. So why is it somebody's put green cutlery, green toys, green pens? Jeez. My job's tough, isn't it, mate? So, now here's some of the, I've got some screenshots of this, and you can look at these slides later, but these are how different some of the sorting works, just to show that 
Ian and the mechanics of the world are doing their, uh, mechanical engineers of the world, sorry, give an upgrade, are doing their bit. But we're sorting on size. So small stuff flies through the belt, big stuff bounces over. Flat stuff bounces one way, 3D stuff rolls the other way. Simple stuff, but it works for sorting paper from plastic. Magnetic separation. So if you've still got steel cans, aluminium cans going through with some of your plastics, you can whip them off. Overbound magnet falls off the steel, eddy current flips off the aluminium. Suddenly, you've got a very clean plastic stream. Plastic stream will then come through, you've got air nozzles and you've got these infrared, the near infrared. Basically, you're looking at a refraction from the, uh, the, the plastic container. You can tell the difference between HDPE, milk bottle, PET, water bottle. And the air jet goes ping, it's all computerized. You get about 98% efficiency of the sort. It's not bad going, given how quickly these belts are going, 15 meters a second. This stuff flies, literally. And then we've got people. And it's interesting, sometimes the people are doing positive sort, they're targeting a material, sometimes it's negative sort, they're targeting a contaminant, the stuff we don't want. So, what do you think the worst thing I've found on a picking belt is? Live animals. Who? Live, Live animals. animals. Oh my God, no, close. <laughs> I've had a 20 foot boa constrictor, <laughs> dead, <laughs> but still it's a big old beast. It's green waste. Uh, green waste. Yes. It wasn't an anaconda. <laughs> Anything else? Needles. Needles. We always get lots of needles. Uh, there was a 500,000 pound diamond ring. <gasps> that was Kensington and Chelsea. All right. <laughs> that, that ain't Northampton. It amazes me some of the stuff that people put out. But anyway, now what happens to that plastic? Well, here's a bale of the effectively HDPE. It's mainly white based. You shred it, you pull out some of the residue, you can do a sortation or a flotation to make sure that there's no unwanted plastics left in there. Then you turn it into uh, the pellet. The pellet becomes the feedstock, and that's what goes into a Coca Cola or a Unilever or Procter and Gamble processing plant for their new bottles. Simple, really. But clearly, they only want that. They don't want the red ones in with the blue. They don't want the pink ones. They don't want ones that are stripy. And so, in the future, when the big brands start focusing more, and I'll come on to that in a moment, on material stream, they're going to want real quality, which means that I'm going to have to deliver better quality for them, which means I'm going to ask you to do a bit more for me, because we've all got a stake in the game. Okay? So, waste management. It's not alchemy, it's engineering. So, policy landscape, what's going on at the moment? Some of the hot topics, things that are in the media. I'm not going to dwell on these, but I just want to mention some of these because they're fundamental. So, it's been a really busy three years, even if I have been in lockdown, because I've never seen so much policy reform coming out of DEFRA, environment, base, industry, treasury, tax, and increasingly, Department for Education. I'll come back to that. All these government departments, and then you go Wales, it's got their own agenda, you know, they're doing their own thing. Oh, and there's Scotland, because they won't do anything that England's doing. They're going to go harder, faster, quicker, you know, more blue, who knows? But it's interesting space. So here we go, we've got four fundamental policy reforms happening right now. The next three years, nothing like this ever before changing in our sector. Top left, EPR, extended producer responsibility. Brands, let's play with Coca-Cola again, will be taxed for every piece of packaging they put on the market. And the value of that tax will equate to how easy it is to capture it, process it, and return it to the market. So if you give me Tetra Pak cartons, you know the waxy ones? Cardboard, aluminium, plastic, glue, that's much harder than an HDP bottle, which is HDPE. So the variable taxation, you're going to start seeing this as consumers about three years from now. So we're going to change them off and we're going to put another 1.5 billion pounds into local government coffers to get all of that material out in the right way. Because up to now, you've paid for it through your taxation at home. Now you're going to pay for it as a consumer. So if you want to buy Tetra Pak, are hard to recycle, you're going to pay more for it than the people that are buying high recycle content, easy to recycle. Next three years. Top right, DRS, deposit return. The idea that I take my bottle, 
and I go down the high street and I drop it in the recycling bank or the special revending machine and I get a little token. Or you take it back to the supermarket. Some of you may have experienced that before. If you've ever shopped in France, they're everywhere. 20p on a can, 20p on a two litre bottle of pop. What's going to happen? Well, all that material in theory comes out of my bin, your bin. You won't put it in there. You don't want me collecting it because you won't get the deposit back. Will you buy 20 cans of Coca-Cola or will you buy four two litre bottles of Coca-Cola? There's a lot more tax on one than the other. Four times 20 versus 20 times 20. It's up to you. If you're going to take it back, you don't care, do you? But if you're low income, you might care because that money's still not in your pocket. So that's DRS. And it's going to completely pull material out of our system, which is going to be really interesting for how many vehicles do we run and how many compartments do we run. And actually, is our MRF even relevant anymore? Down here, tax. So this is the one that hits tomorrow. First of all, plastic tax. If you put a plastic bottle on the market as of the 1st of April in a batch with under 30% recycled content, and you can't prove it, that it's over 30%, you'll be taxed £200 per tonne by government, by Treasury. If you're in Europe, they tax you £500 per tonne. But it's still quite, a, quite an incentive, or a disincentive, even though. In theory, you're going to drive secondary resource markets. Coca-Cola wants this back because they're going to get hammered by fines. They're knocking on our door. How do we get hold of this material? Can you give it to me clean? to meet the specifications that we want, because we're buying all this virgin stuff from somewhere in Southeast Asia. Can you help us? So a really interesting dynamics happening right now here. Yeah? More recycled content. I bet you don't know what the recycled content is of the bottles that you buy, do you? Plastic bottles, anyone want to guess? 10, 10, 10, 10 higher. Se Whoa, leave now. About 15%. Aluminium, what's the recycled content of aluminium? Yeah, good man. Well done. That's because it's valuable. <laughs> and finally, the one that you'll see, consistent collections. The idea that it doesn't matter where you live, where you work, which gym you go to, or where you go on holiday in the UK, it doesn't matter. You'll have the same materials being collected. So there'll be no issues with you going, oh no, I've just got over the border. Do they do yoghurt pots? I hope they do yoghurt pots and you put it in your recycling bin. Now, we're not going to make the bins consistent. You won't all have the same blue bin or pink bin or grey bag. No, local authorities can pick a mix, but you will have the same materials. In theory, that reduces the contamination that we have to handle. It should improve the quality. So there's a lot going on. That's actually how much going on. Don't worry about the detail. Every single facet of today's solid waste management system will change in the next five years. The targets are moving. The funding is moving. The responsibilities are changing. Our relationship with Europe just changed. New technologies, consistency, new monitoring programs, new online data systems. The world, I've been in waste management for 25 years. This is kind of scary, but it's exciting too. And here's how that new system will work. And you've got certain materials will be targeted by the DRS. They're the ones that you'll get the deposit on. You'll have these other materials that will have the taxation system around them and they'll be the ones that go into your curbside box. So immediately, some of your plastic beverage cartons are going one way and not the other. We're going to make life a bit more complicated for you. Do I go back to the store or not? Do I put it in my curbside bin like I've been doing for a decade? But the idea is we get better quality, more of it, the government's wisdom. I've been arguing most of the week with them about this, but anyway. And these are the materials that we're going to get in that curbside. So you'll recognise these. These are things that you're already doing. But there's going to be a few newbies. Not everybody has a carton collection right now because they're really hard to recycle. Plastic films, 2027. As of this morning, we heard, 2027, you'll be able to put plastic films in your curbside collection somehow. We haven't worked out how yet. Sue is about to start a trial with about a dozen local authorities working out how we do capture it. Because if you put a plastic film in our lorry, by the time it gets to our recycling centre, it's wrapped itself round everything else. 
it's not recyclable, they're not recyclable, the equipment's going bananas because it's getting wrapped around the field. Ugh. Horrible, horrible. But it's coming. But this is interesting because DRS targeting the ones with the deposits, you know, the drinking beverage cartons of some description. This is the content, don't worry about the detail, the content. Something like 10 to 15 percent of all PET bottles will suddenly disappear into DRS. And aluminium cans and glass. So what we would normally collect as a mixed recycling load from your house suddenly starts to have material stripped out of it. Complicating factor. So what's the MRF of tomorrow going to MRF for materials recycling facility? So A, we're going to see more curbside sort. So have you got a mixed box at the moment? A mixed bin? Or have you got lots of little bins? One great bin. Oh, One great the, world's, the world's going to get so much more complicated. So, so you're going to be sorting fibres from glass. Fibres being cardboard and textiles and paper. And then you're going to have plastics and metals, maybe together, maybe not, depends on your authority. But the idea is you keep them separate. They go in that vehicle, just got separate curbside containers at the top. Means I don't have to worry about glass shards in my paper because the paper mill doesn't want them. I don't have to worry about lasagna from my plastic tray dripping all over my newspaper and ruining the quality of the paper. OK, that's the intention. So we're going to see more of that because it's all about quality materials. And what that will mean, again, don't worry about the detail, but it will mean I get better quality material. The end market, the bottle manufacturers get better quality material, but only if everybody in the value chain does their bit. So what's going to incentivize you to use these six boxes? Cash. Cash. Wow. I have, I'll have to talk to government in. I haven't worked out that we need some more cash. There's no more cash for the public. Sorry. That's a good, it's a good point. Ah. Well, this will be the issue. You know, will the, will the 20p deposits be enough to drive some of this behavior? Will the additional cost when you go shopping for the bad non-recyclable items be enough to nudge you in the right direction. Government hopes so. But what about the businesses? Who, who owns a business? Who works in a business? Who goes to the high street, buys stuff and wonders what goes on upstairs in the office? Well, they generate waste as well. looks like yours. We've got to target that as well. All of that material has got to be recycled, just like the stuff you've been doing at home. But you've been doing it at home for 30 years. Businesses haven't been doing it. Average recycling rate in England at the moment, 45%. For you at home, for businesses, under 30%. Everybody's got to do 75% by 2035. Rapid change. So will the public get it right? Well, we don't know. <laughs> Anyone vote on that? <laughs> How many, what's the current, yes, sir? I was just thinking, it, it, it seems quite odd that businesses are, <laughs> in order to recycle businesses, to recycle business ways should be much easier because each business will have large quantities of a specific material but it's not contaminated with anything else. Yep. So our businesses will be leading the way. Really. I think commercial recycling is much easier. Yes. Yeah. But if not every commercial property on the high street is doing it, it becomes a very costly exercise yeah. to go to one who's doing it and dozens that aren't doing it. So you need legislation to drive them. That's the bit that's missing. And the Conservative government, not that I'm political, don't want to give businesses a hard time because I think we've got a recession. So would the public get it right? Well, this is the deposit returns. These are the, the, the drop back bins. You get a zap, you get a ping on your phone, you get a 20p, you get a receipt, whatever it is, the system works. But let's be honest, if you ask the public that they recycle, the evidence is clear, 20% of them are lying. <laughs> Sorry, 20% of them believing that they're recycling, sorry, but they're not. Or actually they're contaminating what everybody else is doing. So my favourite example is yeah, one family in a street of 30, 29 families are recycling, absolutely everything possible. They're brilliant, 75% recyclers rock on. One family, five kids, three of them in nappies, rubbish bins full very quickly. Where are they putting all the nappies? Well, the only bin available, the recycling bin. What happened in the green bin? No, I've already taken that away because they're contaminating that. You ain't having it on. So I'm bringing all that nappies in. It's going in the back of my lorry because my, my guys are in a hurry. They're running. It's, it's wet. They've got to get back for the football. It's all going in the back of the lorry. It gets to my, my site. Lorry 
Kevin's tips it up. Beautiful recycling. Look at it all. 75% of everything. Just what I wanted. Oh my God, what's that smell? Suddenly, nappies all over my recycling. What's happened to all that recycling? I'm just about to take it to the birder because I'm burning it. And what's happened to my site? I've just closed it for 24 hours because it needs a deep clean. One family, possibly a thousand households could have been impacted by that one family because that's how many we're collecting from on the round. But that message doesn't get out, does it? I'm amazed at the number of friends who don't bother to watch their stuff. No, and that's partly because local authorities don't want to be vindictive. But we do need to start clamping down. It's not even on the leaflets. Anyway. <laughs> I'm with you. But, right, everybody knows a logo. Everybody, what's your, your favourite logo on there? Number two, what does that mean? Nothing. Good answer. <laughs> Looks good. Makes you, yeah, it's recycling, isn't it? That's what it says. It says recycling. It doesn't say I can be recycled. It doesn't say I will be recycled. It doesn't even say you should recycle. It just says, hey, recycling. So exactly. number one is important because one thing about this country, we are terrible at dropping things. We are. The of my life. We are. We are. Literally. I'm with you. So tidy man, that's what he's called. <laughs> In principle, yeah, DRS should, should help address littering. Um, I don't want to mention what I'm walking around with at the moment. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Is it is it compostable or recyclable or? Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Well, we'll come back to that one later. Um, unfortunately, most of these are meaningless. This one, this is my favourite. Everybody go, ah, recycling. No. It means that the brand is bought into a European system to fund a recycling system. It doesn't mean that the material is going into it. It just means they paid into it. That's like offsetting. Right. What's your labels? That means it's PET, but it tells you what the material is. It doesn't tell you what to do with it. That one's the only one you should really be interested in. That means recycled or recycling. And in the future, it will mean you can recycle it. There's a new labeling approach coming out. Yes, sir. The triangle they have with it. What does the number actually make? Because it doesn't just have a number. Others actually say what material it is. I'm not any wiser whether the material is recyclable. No. But I know that black isn't. <laughs> it, it tells you what it is in a chemical formula type way. So it's, I, I'm not interested. I don't need to know. You don't need to know. If, it's, if it's PET, good. Yeah. So here we go. Simplicity is key. So we used to have like, labels like this. Widely recycled. Love a label like that. That helped me, didn't it? Phone a friend. Ask the audience. Yeah, rubbish. Now, this is what we're going with. So if you're out and about and you get a bit of packaging, you should be able to go green, recycle, black, do Any doubt, it'll be black. Compostable packaging will be going black in two years' time when the new schemes all roll out. Why? Because it doesn't go in the current system. Our system is designed for food waste. Compostable packaging takes longer to degrade at higher temperatures. You don't want it near your food waste. So until they find a way of either designing a better system, it's going to be called non-recyclable. But still can go in the garden. No. It doesn't, it doesn't compost in the compost years I've tried. Yep. It. So in the future, it'll be a contaminant and you'll be done for it. Same so plastic beakers. Come out year after year when I turn the compost in. Yeah, don't put anything like this in your compost at home. Absolutely not. Now, we've been talking to the government quite a bit about labelling. I just wanted to share this one with you. You're going to wonder whether this would work for you. So, I, I always, my mum is my, my yardstick for everything. So, I'm saying to my mum, look, how do you know if you're buying good, bad, or indifferent? So, if it's got a green dot, it's good. Low carbon impact, high recycled content, easy to recycle, yeah? Newspaper. A PET bottle, for example. If it's red, other snack tubes are available, but I'm thinking Pringles. Um, low recycle content, hard to recycle, high carbon footprint. So are you going to respond to a red or green dot if you knew that one was good and one was bad? Is it going to help you? Not too colorblind. No, I'm serious. <laughs> That's fine. You can get green cheese and onion. You, you can. You're absolutely right. I, 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 I don't eat them, but I have seen them. That's fine. So the idea of simplifying what you buy 
It's something we've been debating government for a long time. Government it's, don't want to do it. It's also surely a question of what it sources for yes. what you can do with it. So there's almost need for two colour schemes. Sorry? Yes, we've tried to combine it into one because, of course, the public are already looking at what's the salt content, what's the sugar content. So is, uh, we're only ever going to get one label, so we have to make it simple. Now, interestingly, most of the residents we've tested this with, and I've tested this with literally thousands of residents, who have gone, yeah, OK, we get it. Yeah, that would help. OK, I'll take that as a win. But they've gone, but that doesn't really help me at all because I still don't know what to do with it when I finish with it. Right, so we came up with this at the bottom. Numbers. Now, these are not the numbers on the bottom of the plastics. We got, we got rid of them. No, they're not used to me at all. But these numbers are plastic bottle would always be a number one. Aluminium can would always be a number three. Now, it doesn't matter where you go or what you do or where you live or where you work. It doesn't matter whether you've got bins or boxes or bags. You look for the number. Would the number make your life easier? Yeah. 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 Mm. I, I call this Pavlov's dog. So I'm going to ring a bell and you know number one goes in that bin. I reckon my mum could get this after about three weeks and I'm done. I'm sorted. Government don't like this idea. It's a good idea. <laughs> it wasn't their idea. There we go. There we go. So now you can see where I'm coming from on this. We're still lobbying for this, but I don't think we're going to get it. But there is quite an interesting lobby out there from local government generally that some form of numbering to take out that confusion might help. Now, I want to show you this. This is system leakage. So this is all the packaging placed on the market in whatever year you want, but it's nearly 12 million tonnes, OK? If 90% of people recycle it, yeah, you good folk who are here tonight, not the ones that didn't turn up, and if you get it right 90%, i.e., OK, you might put the odd thing in that you shouldn't have done, you chance in your arm, you, you thought it used to be recyclable once, yoghurt pots, for example, and you do it 90% of the time, i.e. you might have missed one because you went on holiday, you missed one because you went to the ballet, blah, 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 whatever. You put the bin out too late. That means 73% of the available packaging gets in my lorry. What was the recycling target the government set for us? 75%, well done, team point. Oh, we've already missed it. Shit. I should go home, shouldn't I? This is, this, I'm failing miserably already. Now, when it comes into our system, we're going to take off the glues, we're going to take off the labels, we're going to take the food out of the lasagna tray, because no, you don't recycle that bit. 90% accuracy in the reprocessing market and the recovery market. That means 59% of all the packaging put on the market gets recycled. Do you think there should be more emphasis on people washing out their containers and tins and bottles? We do it, but there's plenty don't. Yeah, I think you need to you need to rinse out your lasagna because lasagna in a tray has many negative impacts. One, it can slop all over my paper and ruin it. Two, if it sits in the back of the lorry for too long, everything starts to stink. Three, um, I'd rather it was in the food waste where it's actually got value. Um, and there's probably another one that I'll come to in a minute. So, but what I don't want is people wasting a lot of water trying to scrub the damn thing. Because there's a balance here. Because if you make it too wet and then put it in your recycling bin with your paper, you've just turned it into paper mache. And all that paper's just been wasted as well. So, yeah, a little bit of refinement. So this is our problem, though. 59%. So I need 95% of people doing 95% of the right thing 95% of the time with 95% efficiency in my facilities to hit the magic 75%. You can see why recycling is not the only answer here. We got, we got a long way to go, haven't we? And so we've got these policy reforms, and this is where we are today. This is England, 44%. And we've got some consistent collections, and that's going to give us 12%. And then DRS and EPR reforms give us another 9%. It's all marvellous. The numbers are great. It's great when you've got a spreadsheet. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to have another million tonnes of sorting, those recycling facilities, a million tonnes. Our recycling plants are about 80,000, 60,000 tonnes apiece. You can start working out how many you're going to need. I'll let you do the maths. You're an intelligent crowd. But you're going to need another million tonnes of pre-sorted monomaterial, so the plastic stream, for example, or a card stream going through our transfer stations. This is where we do bulking up. So you're going to double that capacity again. 
300,000 tons of plastic reprocessing, where you do the cleaning, the shredding, the pelletizing. At the moment, we're well below that. And how about this number? Let's call it 2 million, because I like a round number. 2 million tons of organic treatment for food and garden waste. 2 million tons. Average AD plant, Ian? Throughput, any idea? We just built one. 60,000 tons. 60,000 tons, 2 million tons. Keep working on it. And that's, not, and that's not a small building. No. There's going to be planning permissions somewhere near you sometime soon for all of this new infrastructure. And we know how long it takes to get things built. Because stuff gets stuck. Planning appeals, local campaigns, can't get the funding, delays in policy. This is our eco plant. There is your. But the AD plant's there, isn't it? That one at the back. So um, but none of this is simple. So you look at that transformation that I've been talking about. And actually, there's a lot of things that might slow it down. Changing policy, changing local policies. So what are we going to be doing then in this 2025, 2026 world? When all this policy settles and I've retired, we're going to be doing more. I know I'm not that optimistic. More source segregation. So we, we, you, sorry, we, you are going to be doing more sorting at home. More bins, more boxes, more bags. Thank you. More monitoring material coming through the things like DRS and the take back to the stores. We're going to have MRFs that have to realign. The recycling centres are going to have to have very different feedstocks. We're going to have to redesign them. Different technology. What's that? Home time? Um, uh, but anyway, our EFWs, and I've not really talked about EFWs yet, but so, you know, they take the residual, the stuff that can't be recycled. There's going to be a lot less of it. You're going to take the plastics out. You're going to take the organics out. Well, what is going to EFWs? Probably nappies. And I'm struggling after that. The residues of some of these other sorting systems, the bits and bobs, the fines that drop out the bottom of the sorting plants. But really, you're going to have EFWs that are going to be taking a lot less. So anybody that's had a planning application, don't worry. There'll be less of them in the future for EFW. I know they're not very popular. But they still play an important role as we transition towards 2030, 2040, when these policy reforms are then fully bedded in. But what I want to mention is these, because I think these are quite interesting for you. Reuse and repair. Reuse cafes, repair cafes. The idea that you get stuff, <clears throat> even from Amazon, other retailers are available, and you can get it mended locally, or you can send it away to get it mended. This is, this is the new, the new normal. The old, the old. <laughs> Thank you. Because actually, when, when materials have real value, when products have real value, it makes sense to do this. People don't give up their cars when their windscreen smashes, they replace it. I know people that give up their phones when their screen smashes. But here's a figure for you. If every household in the UK put out two items for repair, a year. Is that is that a fair number? You've all got phones, printers, old laptops. The list is endless. Two items per year. How many people do you think I'm going to employ? Trained, skilled repairers. The answer is higher. 40,000. And an economy worth 1.4 billion. The waste management sector at the moment only has under 35,000 people working in it. This is the future because it's local, it's skilled, it's green, it's sustainable. But we've got to convince a few people to actually want to do it, and we've got to convince some of the manufacturers to play nicely. And there is legislation coming in from Europe that will force this, and we have signed up to it, eco-design legislation, which means you have to design for repair, and you have to make the, the spare parts available to repair it, not only through the brand, but through other providers. So what's hot and what's not? Sixty thousand more jobs in our sector if we can reprocess all of the recycling that we currently send overseas. But we send it overseas because there are no markets in the UK. And why are there no markets in the UK? Because a lot of our bottles come from Southeast Asia because that's where Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble and others have their production facilities. So there's no point us making the bottles here if you're then going to send them to Southeast Asia to fill them. 
So we need to create the right infrastructure, the right network. But 60,000 jobs and a huge amount of carbon savings. These are CO2 emissions. Carbon's the, the hot topic. Waste, 26%. I don't know why everybody's getting so upset about it. But they're getting upset because they think it's my energy from waste plants. It's those big ugly burners, it's those chimneys. So we get a really bad press. I'd rather take a look at transport and say, stop driving your car. Because I only manage what society throws away. It's, my industry doesn't generate any waste. I handle waste. And yet we get bad press. So sometimes I get a bit annoyed. So there you go, that's my hobby horse. But if you look at some of the um, carbon budgets that come out of the um, Committee on Climate Change, you know, all of these potential carbon benefits from renewable heat obligations and car fuel efficiency and God knows what else. Look at this number down here. Just by going more resource efficient, just by doing eco design, we can outstrip all of the things that have been in the carbon budgets. But we won't because you're going to upset some brands. You can ask the public to do things differently. This is interesting, isn't it? And look at the targets. Are we targeting the right things? Waste prevention plan 10 years ago delivered a 0.01% reduction on waste in the UK. I mean, if I was a minister, I'd be well chuffed. I've delivered. Look, there's a, there's a real number. We've never had a target for waste prevention in this country. We've never had a target that really drove reuse or repair. All our targets were about recycling. Now, in the Environment Bill uh, Act, which is live, there is now a target being consulted on to halve resource use. That means we've got to do things differently. And then there's a target for me to halve residual waste. So the stuff that goes for disposal, EFW and landfill. And the reason we're doing that is because look at the carbon benefits. Green light, metal. Recycled, bottom chunk, avoided, top chunk. So by avoiding these materials, i.e. reuse, repair, or just not buying them in the first place, you have so much more carbon benefit. And so we're going to have to, if we're serious about net zero, decarbonisation, we've seriously got to work out how we're going to substitute materials, or better still, just buy less of them. And that means buying into a service economy. So is anybody wearing the stuff tonight that you don't own but didn't steal? <laughs> just clarifying. Does charity shop count? Charity shop's good. I'll give you a bonus point, but it's not the full five marks. Is anybody wearing anything they've rented? It's the new black. Renting clothes. Because they go back and then they get used by somebody else. And they go back and they get mended and used by somebody else. And you don't get bored with them because you only have them for a month or six months or whatever. How about buying a pair of jeans? I've not, I, don't, I've not, I don't own my jeans. I own access to leg coverings made from denim. <laughs> a very sexy phrase, that one. If I was to put some weight on over COVID, I, put, I lost a lot of weight. They will take my jeans and replace them with the jeans that fit. If I was to fall over and crack my knee and rip them apart, and I don't want to go for that mid-80s look, they'd mend them or replace them from their stock of similar jeans. You're buying the stuff. How many people rent their property? How many people rent their phone? There's increasing servitization in our modern world. It's just we don't do it for some items like clothing when we could. And I think in the future, you're not going to own a power tool. You're going to have a power tool for the whole street and you're going to borrow it. This kind of community, because we don't need 37 power tools, do we? Really? I, I haven't used one in five years. I mean, I, that's a horrible thought. So this is the kind of future. And you look at embedded carbon, and this happens in West London, but everybody says, Adam, where's those recycling? Get, get, get the materials. And I'm like, oh, slow down. Why are we collecting those materials? If you were serious about reducing carbon, you'd go, I need to get the textiles and I need to get the food waste, organic waste out of my bin. But we don't. We chase glass. We chase metal. Why? They're easy to handle and also they weigh. Glass is heavy. So when you've got a recycling target, well, tick. Carbon's going to change the way we think about what we collect and how we collect. 
Okay, waist hierarchy. Everybody happy with something like this? It's upside down before you scream at me. So, refuse, reduce, reuse. These are all things that are outside of my comfort zone. I can't deal with these. I'm, I'm a waste manager. Rehome, repair. There we go, recycle. That's where all of the policy reform is. Recycle. It's missing all of these options, all of these things that we could do better, more of, to reduce our footprint. What was rot? Rot. Or you just leave it. Compass. Oh, literally. Okay. Nature doing its thing. Here we go. I was a cop two weeks, honestly. Was it good? Was it bad? What do you think of cop? Bad. bad. Not a lot. Bad. Nobody's giving it like singing and dancing. Okay, the headline for COP, here we go, this is honest truth. Come out of the green zone, give it a, give it a presentation. And I'm trying to get over the bridge, because Glasgow, city of bridges, um, and some Colombian uh, uh, Aboriginal Indians were, uh, were dancing on the street corner, very nice, nice bongo drums or something. And then suddenly it all kicked off. And before I knew it, there was about 500 policemen and they closed down the bridge. So all I remember from COP is I missed my dinner date and I missed my meeting with the minister because I had to walk six miles to get to the next bloody bridge. <laughs> that was the highlight of COP. Right, here we go. Food waste. 70% of food wasted in the UK post farm gate, so ignoring what happens on the farms now, is wasted by citizens in your own homes. Because your fridge is at the wrong temperature, because you don't use your fridge properly, because you buy one, get one free, you didn't need the one free. Because you've forgotten that you can make a stew or a soup the next day. Because you didn't plan your meals because you're rushing around. COVID's been great for this. I'm at home with my family most nights. We plan our meals. Our food waste plummeted. 81% of citizens in the UK are concerned about climate change. Of course you are. 37% realise uh, realize that, sorry, don't realise the connection. 37% do realise, so 63% don't. And this is the big fundamental for me is, if we're trying to get people to do food waste prevention or food waste recycling, historically we've been promoting, it's good for you, it's gonna save you money. The average UK household can save about 500 pounds on their shopping bill by planning their shopping better, by not wasting leftovers. Is it a time to get rid of best before? It's going. It's going, isn't it? Yep. And we're now going to start messaging the fact that this is your role in climate change mitigation. Because it's the one thing you can do. If you can't change your car in, this, in the near future, or you can't stop having holidays overseas, you can get your food waste right. So I think, you know, this is something we can all do, even students. The thing about this, 41% of the food waste is not used in time. 25% was cooked, prepared, but you serve too much because, you know, I know, I'm, oh, a bit of pasta tonight, lump it up, I can never finish it. Oh, that's why I've lost some weight, because I'm now eating the rough portions. So there we go, it's all good news. It's really important that we think about these material foods. Now who goes shopping and refills their own containers? Because this is coming, there are supermarkets that are offering this right now, but it's not the norm. Is this convenient for you? Do you want the packaging or do you take your own? Tupperware, everybody remembers Tupperware. Make it a comeback. And what is that? It's valuable soil enhancer. Only if we have quality, clean feedstock. Our composting sites do wonders. But if you put a load of plastic in with your food waste, when it comes out of my wonderful site, it's still with plastic. I don't know a farmer yet that looks at that and goes, oh Adam, it's got red and pink and purple bits in it. I'd love to put that on the land, sod off, or something similar. So quality feedstocks. And how about reuse? So I'm going to come back to reuse because I'm very passionate about reuse. Reuse delivers all sorts of other benefits beyond things that recycling can do. So reuse is going to enable you to retrain people because we need skilled repairs, upgrades. It gives you an opportunity to put products back into local communities, perhaps the disadvantaged, maybe students, maybe it's those on welfare. 
But to get reuse right, you have to really understand what you're getting, what materials you handle, and what can you do with it. So you might want to resell it, you might want to refresh before you resell it, you might need to repair it, you might need to refurb it, more and more effort, of course. You might have to recover one part of the component, you might need to replace something, and the list goes on. So reuse is not a simple one trick pony. But this is the future. We're going to have these hubs. We've got this one in Greater Manchester. We're harvesting reusable stuff, bikes, furniture, white goods, from 27 sites or from about a million people around Greater Manchester. And we're then helping do that with local charitable groups and putting those bikes to good use and putting the furniture back into good use at very low prices. Now, we make a little turn on that. You have to, to triple bottom line. Sustainability means you're allowed to make a bit of money, but the bottom line is they don't have to go and buy IKEA. They don't have to go, I can't afford a bike from Halfords. So really important step change. So here's the centre. So carpentry, carpentry 101. We've got some brilliant carpenters, but more importantly, they're teaching tens of future carpenters. Bike repairs. These guys are fantastic. Some of the bikes they've got, they've got boardman bikes, it's crazy. But then we've also got these. These are like aspirational lifestyle reuse. So you take some good items of furniture and you get in a designer from the local university and she goes bish bash bosh and suddenly she's giving you that whole, doesn't this look fantastic? And you're selling that stuff for more than Ikea is selling it because now you're putting it in the context of class. And it's what, what I've learned about reuse is, this is all about marketing. And that's why, who watches TV? Of course you watch TV. Who watches all those reuse programs? All the ah, salvage hunters, this, they're everywhere, aren't they? It's all about aspiration. It's all about understanding what you can do. You can sell that stuff for good money and put that money back into the community. And that's what reuse of tomorrow is all about. I've already given you examples. Here's another example, which is not mine, but it's another one. This is the remake, uh, re remaker in Edinburgh. But they've got shop front in the, in the main store, in the main um, shopping centre. All their messaging is very clear. It's all about carbon saving. It's all about quality products. Here we go on TV. Tell me when we get to your, your favourite one, you know, whoop and holler. Money for nothing. She's quite cool. She does come down to suicide sites on a regular basis. They use our sites to pull the material. The repair shop. Yeah. Oh, Jay, he's, he's the new celebrity, isn't he? Um, yeah, we're in discussions with him about doing some work in Manchester right now. And what about this? Home shopping. So this is Tesco working with Loop. Now, during lockdown, everybody was at home. My mum went, I ain't going to the supermarket. That's chaos, you know, shells are bare, I've got to wear a mask and all that. She started shopping online for the first time ever. She won't go back to a supermarket now. Okay, so Loop. Major brands are giving you a refillable solution. So my favourite, Hagen dazs There you go. Hagen dazs ice cream with a bit of Netflix. I'll have a binge session for two hours. I don't want my ice cream melting. Take it in a Hagen dazs tub. You know what they're like, waxy cartons. They melt from the bottom because my hand's hot. By the time I've got into episode two, it's mush. <laughs> It's now milkshake time. It's not, I'm not happy, am I? Brush steel container, hagen dazs melts from the top, where I'm eating it. Always icy cold at the bottom, happy days. Two hours of Netflix, I'm still going strong. When I'm finished, here's the, here's the real message, when I'm finished, Loop will take it back, Tesco will take it back, it'll get cleaned and it'll get refilled. You pay a deposit for that container. After seven, eight, nine, ten times, You've made your deposit, basically. So this is long-term refill at home. Could be a real game changer. But it's going to cost a bit to start. Is my mum ready for this? I've only just got off shopping online. I'm not sure this is, <laughs> this is quite right. But could be interesting. Things are happening. So it's all happening. Oh, I won't bore you with carbon. Carbon's so this is the UK waste carbon footprint over the last couple of decades. Why has it dropped so much? because we're taking organics out of landfill. Why do we do that? Because Europe told us to. So that's why we recycle and we burn it. Now we've got to take it out of burning because that's not great. And we've got to move on. And then people say to me, oh, the details, irrelevant. It's more that we get hung up on thermal treatment and what's the carbon footprint of burning stuff. It's there. But that's the carbon footprint, the landfilling stuff. And that's why we're trying to shrink landfill. By 2028, there'll be an organic banned landfill. You won't be able to put anything in it. 
So that segregation at source is going to be really important. But have a look at this one. Vehicles, electricity to run our sorting plants. And as we handle more material, so the energy demand goes up. If we don't green the grid, our carbon footprint goes up, not down. Crazy look. So what are we going to be doing to bring the carbon footprint of the waste sector down? We're going to build infrastructure to deliver 75% recycling, as long as we green the grid as well, outside of our control. We're going to take organics out of landfill. We're going to take plastics out of VFW. Why? Because if you burn a tonne of plastics, you put a tonne of carbon dioxide in the air. Give or take. That's one of the big bugbears from the campaigners. We're going to put carbon capture, utilisation of storage. There we go, a bit of technology, promise to get there. We're going to put our magic stuff on the back end of our big infrastructure and we're going to suck the carbon dioxide out. Deep sea storage. I haven't worked out how long it's going to be there for. I'm not sure what I'm doing with it in 100 years time, but we'll get around to that. But bottom line is, I can go carbon positive. I can start sucking more carbon dioxide out than we're producing. Now, I don't want that to be the answer to decarbonising our sector, but it will be part of the answer. And we're going to go zero emission vehicles. I say zero emission because I don't think the answer is electric only. We've looked at hydrogen vehicles as well. Long distance haulage is not going to be electric. So there's a lot going on. And this is our facility that we're building. We've just got Bayes approval, um, government department, to build, um, we've got moved to the next stage of the net zero T site. So we're working with a number of industrial um, facilities that have all got big carbon footprints working together on on this technology. But carbon capture and storage is down here. It's like sequestering, it's burying it, it's parking it somewhere safe. Lock it up. But reality, if you're really serious about carbon, you've got to get up here. You've got to think about alternative technologies to produce less of it. So changing uh, the equipment you use, or you've just got to do less of the activities that generate it in the first place. So eco design I mentioned. Repair, more data, less multiple handling of materials. All of these are going to drive down the carbon. But I was at COP and I got very frustrated at COP and I let Rishi see that guy because I was having dinner. He was sitting on the table next to me. He wasn't having dinner with me before anybody else, but he was next to me. So I sided over to him. One Planet Living. We could be net zero carbon and still use all the resources on the planet. Because we're measuring one indicator, not all. So at the moment, the West uses three times the planet's resource footprint. We've got to get that down to one, which means you lot, I've got to start consuming this. So there we go. If we assume one planet living, 7.65 tonnes per person of resources is our current allowance. On one world, one world living, one planet living, it's 3.19 tonnes. That's a 58% reduction from today of resources that you consume. So basically switch your heating off half the time, tumble dry goes off 60% of the time, and you only eat on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. <laughs> Sorry, you only eat local vegetables Monday to Friday. Is that better? They're local vegetables. Now, if the planet keeps growing, sorry, the population keeps growing, that current actually drops more because more people for the same resources, you're down to 2.78. That's a 64% reduction. Now, that's assuming we're all going to do the right thing and play nicely. Scary thoughts. But... European resource consumption, 45 kilograms per day. African resource consumption, 10 kilos per day. So once Africa gets up to speed with us, with their resource consumption, there won't be enough nickel, iron, lithium, boron, cobalt around to make our electric vehicles go, because China will have them all stashed away, geopolitics. But even if there was a fair distribution, we've got a real problem on our hands. So this is the reality of one planet living. And here's another buzzword you didn't hear at COP very often, biodiversity. So I can go net zero, and I can do that by chopping down all the forests, sorry, rebuilding the forests to create timber 
to burn in my biomass plant to generate electricity. Carbon zero, carbon net zero. The bottom line here is we've now got no wildlife and we've also got no agriculture because we just turned it all over the trees. That isn't sustainable if we were looking at UK PLC. And at the moment, we're bringing in all sorts of biomass from Canada. You can work out the maths on that one. So again, which policy driver is more important? Because I'm living in a world where I'm getting tugged by one planet living, sustainability, net zero carbon. Net zero carbon is the one in town because it's the one that's legislated for. These ones are coming down the track. There's consultations live on targets for these now. How are we doing? You're all scared stiffness, aren't you? Right, Wombles time. Everybody remember the Wombles? Yes. Who's your favourite? Orinoco. Why? The Great River. So, Tobermory, far left, he could repair anything. He was the ultimate Womble in my eyes, because he did the hard work. Madame Chalet, she's not even on there. It's a bit harsh, isn't it? I think the second one's meant to be, but Madame Chalet could cook anything. Food residue. She is Mrs. Food Redistribution. OK, which Wombles do we need in the future? This is the question we're going to ask. So, our sector today, not diverse, ageing, not attractive to youngsters. The list goes on. It's not great, is it? I'm painting a terrible picture for my 10 year old. Look at this. 12% of our workforce are over 60. 16% are female and 7% are ethnic. It's a really odd sector, isn't it, when you look at it like that? But it's changing because we recognise it has to change. The trade bodies, the professional bodies, we're all working collaboratively to reposition ourselves. So, Green Jobs Task Force presented last year, linked to COP, recognised that there's a lot of transition happening Manufacturing, chemicals, agriculture, transport, waste. Are we all transitioning together nicely, planned? Are we fighting for resources? Do we even know what we need? Turns out we don't know. But we know that 2050 is the reality for net zero. So some good reports, Green Alliance is a fantastic one. How the circular economy can not only generate 500,000 jobs. How many people work in our industry today? 135,000. We're going to generate 500,000 by going circular, looping materials, better business models. World Economic Forum looks at this from a global perspective. Their figures are really scary. 50% of everybody's core skills today will be irrelevant in five years. Wow. I don't know what courses you're meant to run at university to deal with that uncertainty. <laughs> So there's those numbers, 450,000 jobs in the circular economy. So how do we make that a reality? One, we've got to work with universities and colleges, higher education, further education, and my son's primary and secondary schools to make sure this stuff is interesting, to make sure we've got people coming through that want to work in this space, that want to be superheroes, climate change activists, engineers of tomorrow. But we also need to make sure we're getting money into those courses because nothing runs without money. And the green agenda is all about getting money in the right place. STEM. STEM got mentioned so many times earlier when I was chatting. STEM is important, absolutely fundamental. Digital skills, project management skills, communication. If I'm going to take 60 million people on a journey that's going to make resource consumption unpopular and reuse the norm, I'm going to have to be a really good salesman. Because I'm not selling them anything that they're going to like, am I? I was up before government, I was at one of the uh, committees, what was it, Christmas time maybe, and um, giving evidence, which is always fun. I've never known so many politicians arguing amongst themselves because they want the last word. They've invited all these experts in, but all they do is bicker. If you've ever been to a, a, a public committee, you just got to take it. It's just like, yeah, whatever. But um, big numbers again, big numbers. 15,000 these, 10,000 loads, loads of new trainers. Where's the regulators? Where's the new technologies? I mean, the bottom line is we just don't know. But here we go. For all the numbers that we could come up with, there's 10 times as many embedded in other industries. So, so people say to me, Adam, what's the future of resources and waste management? And my answer is that we don't exist. 
I don't want to be the chartered institution of resource management in the future. We should be embedded in the agricultural sector, the manufacturing sector, the NHS, and the list goes on. Because my job is to get your resources round and round in a far better way. I can't do that if I'm considered somewhere else. You're them over there. I pay you to do something. No, I should be part of your system. That's the fundamental shift that I was arguing for at COP. Make us, us relevant to those sectors. So don't set me a target for decarbonisation. Set other industries a target and I'll help them deliver. That's how you make us valuable. <laughs> Government just looks at me. Anyway, my presidential report. So as president, I get to do a report. So I said, right, we're going to do one on skills for the future because this is a topic I'm passionate about. We're going on a journey from a recycling economy, which I've already shown you is not very efficient, through a resource economy to the carbon economy, which is only one of the measures. You know that that's not the answer. So this one, the circular economy, the one where stuff goes around for longer, where we buy less stuff, where things are more efficient. And to get there, we're going to be working on communications and behaviour change. We're going to do data, information, technology, data, knowledge, power, real time decision making, artificial intelligence, enabling us to be real time. The circular economy, we've already heard a lot about that. We used to repair, I've always you senseless. Soft skills, are we listening? Do I know what those markets need? Do I know what those industries are going through? How can I support them? That's the listening, the soft skills. Then systems thinking, this is my big bugbear. Three calls with government today, three different departments. I think two of them were speaking different languages and none of them were in Wales or Scotland. Bayes and DEFRA, different pages. Department for Education, different country. <laughs> Policy leaders, I can pull EPR, I can pull DRS, I can pull behaviour change, I can pull labelling, I can pull export bans, I can ban stirrers and coffee cups. What's the ripple effect of any one of those? And if they all get pulled, do they all work or do they counterbalance? This is the bit that worries me. Systems thing. We haven't got enough of them, certainly not in government, but generally in our environment. And they need to work across our sectors because otherwise we're going to have 20,000 chemical engineers working in the fuels and transport sector in 2025 to 2030. And then I'm going to have 20,000 chemical engineers working in waste management from 2035 onwards. Why don't I just borrow this? Why don't we create chemical engineers that can work across multiple sectors rather than go, we all need 20,000. So then we go to government and say, we need 200,000 chemical engineers by 2035. And all the universities go, happy days. I'm having some of that. Look, the ears are pricking over there. <laughs> she's actually tweeting it. 200,000 chemical engineers by 2035. The number's not real. Um, and then you have all these courses, and then in year one, nobody goes. Because we don't need 200,000 chemical engineers, we need 20,000 chemical engineers. This is the joined up approach that I think is really worrying about skills for tomorrow. So what would these jobs look like? And there's loads of stuff on there. And I'm sure you might like one or more of them. But I just think so much of it is skilled, it's hands-on. And then there's the really interesting data and forward thinking stuff. And how are we making this work in my sector? Well, we're working with these sectors to make it work because I told you I can't do it on my own. I've got to make my skill set relevant to the logistics base. With under DRS, all that material doesn't come to me. It goes straight back to Tesco's or straight back to Coca-Cola. So how do I get my skills in their world to make sure that works better? Just one example. I'm working with designers at the moment, Pepsi-Cola, one example. Bring me in, Adam. We're thinking about changing this packaging. If we do this to it, what happens? And I just sit there going, don't. Because it won't get in my system. It will never come out the other end. You won't be very happy. Oh, OK, Adam, thanks very much. Two years later, yep, it's on the market. <laughs> Interestingly, we created a joint apprenticeship with Unilever, Suez and Unilever. We put their designers in a room with my waste managers and went, great, now design the shampoo bottle of tomorrow. Well, after about six weeks of arguing like cats and dogs about who was right, they did come up with some really great innovative designs that were appropriate for the products, would fit on a shelf, or well, not a shelf, because they also realised that selling in the future wasn't about shelf. It was about what it looked like on social media. Yeah. And was easy to segregate and therefore process at my end. Bingo. That's the future. Joint apprenticeships joint collaboration in the industry. So we're working with government to try and get a GCSE in climate change or a 
or an A-level in resource management. Yeah, I've got no chance, have I? Kevin and Perry, come on, go large. But we do need to make some career paths more visible to engineers and policymakers tomorrow. I'm very worried. I'll, I'll be looking at my son's 10, so he takes 11 plus next year. And um, so I'm looking at what, what some of the schools do in terms of their, their subjects at GCSE. And it's very obvious that choices he will make in three years from now will lock him into GCSEs and therefore A-levels and ultimately restrict his choice of degree. He's 10. And I'm looking at all these schools and some of these schools are unbelievable. And I'm still going, I still can't see how I'm going to get a climate change activist who's going to save the planet in terms of some systems thinking based on the fact that they do a lot of maths and they like to teach Spanish. It's really difficult. What Choices in a, I'm a school governor. You can do history or geography, but you can't do history and geography. What? Two fundamental, you learn more lessons in there than you will in many other subjects, but it's okay because you can do physics, chemistry and biology separate. They're all right. So we're looking after some of the sciences. So I don't want to upset the audience. But there's other disciplines. You can't. I can't get environment science anywhere near. It's been taught as part of something else. Climate change is too important. Got to be embedded somewhere. So apprenticeships are really vital. With, and I've told you about it, some examples. Uh, this is Amy. Amy, one of our apprentices, doing some really great work at the moment. Bright as a button. But you know, we've got apprentices of all walks and all types. And I think it's amazing sometimes just the things we get up to um, in our world. So we've now got this group, the Skills for the Future group. A lot of people sit in dark rooms going, so what is it the skills of 2030 and 2035 look like? Where do, where do we get support for that training? Who do we work with? Which professional institutions? There we go. That's why I'm here. Which other professional institutions can we work with? Chemical engineers, civil engineers, mechanical engineers. There's, there's some brands on here. You know who you are. We can't all do this in isolation. I think it's great that there's a, a collaboration here already tonight. I agree with that. So I always ask this question, I'm getting towards the end of the evening. Are you ready for change? Adaptation and growth. I think these things are really fascinating. When I go into university by now, they're all scratching their head going, yeah, he's mad. Um, but I'm so excited about the green agenda, a green economy, a resource efficient future, a circular economy. So what wombles do I need? I promise to come back. So we need Toby Mori doing the repairs. I need some engineers. I'm not going to specify what they are, but it's not 200,000 chemical engineers, I promise you. I need some comms experts. I need some green designers, designers that love recycled content, designers that embrace refill. I want a technologist or two, because if I want carbon capture, I need technologies. If I want advanced thermal treatment, I need technologies. If I want chemical recycling, I need technologists. And then we're going to need a load of data people, people that could improve systems. Because that's what you do, isn't it? <laughs> people that can give me data so I can help my customers make real time decisions about what they're doing or not doing. So is my sector irrelevant? Well, I'd like to think it will be. I'd like to think I become embedded in everybody else's sector. We become that collaborative partner on a journey of investigation and circularity. But I'm also worried that there are a lot of other bodies out there that are all talking a good game. Every other professional institution that I seem to come across has a circular economy or a resource efficiency working group these days. Back off, it's my space. <laughs> <laughs> Let's collaborate, sorry, that's my thing. But I think it's really important that if we don't get this transition right, we're gonna to get told what to do by government who clearly don't know what they're doing, but we'll end up down the wrong avenue. So we've got to embrace the change. We've got to map out the change. We've got to set the government's agenda about the skills, the technologies, the innovation and spend, because they can't do it on their own. In the next five years in my sector, we're going to change the bins, you're going to change the materials. We're going to be backhauling and DRS. There's going to be so much more consumer engagement and it's going to be led by not your local authority, not confusing you with all these messages about what happens locally. No, 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 no. It's going to be Coca-Cola, it's going to be Procter & Gamble, it's going to be Kellogg's. They're going to be talking to you direct because they want your materials back. And which brand do you believe? Local government, central government or Coca-Cola? 
Well, I can tell you now, Coca-Cola always scores highest. Nobody believes me because I've got doctor before my name, clearly, and I work in the private sector. Bah, rubbish. Exciting times. And what can you do? We well, can get involved. Events like tonight are great. Shop smart, using the labels, we embrace reuse and repair where you can. Lease products. Somebody lease your clothes. Go for it. Let me know how you get on. Do your segregation at home properly. I've told you what a contaminant is now. Don't go putting it in the bin. Um, be supportive as we move forward. Challenge your favourite brands if they're not doing enough. Easter's coming. Anybody like an overwrapped Easter egg? <laughs> they're banned in my house. Sorry, son. Thank you. I'm still taking questions, but you were doing it such a good job as you went. <laughs> with what? Cooking oil. So you can segregate it. You can recycle it, um, and it can go as a fuel. There's one of the end markets, not the only end market, but you have to take.